once we get saved, can we always stay safe no matter how we live? So, so we give our heart to the Lord, we get saved, we pray the prayer of salvation. Okay, eternal life is now living on the inside of us because Jesus takes residence. That's all scripture. Can we backslide? Is, is, is backsliding biblical? Now, <clears throat> the church that I would visit growing up on Easter and Christmas and vacation Bible school because I like the Kool-Aid and cookies, um, their doctrine says once you're saved, you're always saved. And that's what justified my lifestyle when I was a teenager. Hey, I believed in Jesus, and I believed that he came, and I believed that he existed, and I believed that he died. And there's none righteous, no, not one, and there's no way I'm ever going to live up to God's standards. And, but that's what grace is for. That's what led me to getting de uh, demonically possessed. In my ignorance, because I didn't study the scripture, I didn't even go to church, I believed that to be the case. So some of you know my testimony, but just the quick version here. I said drugs and alcohol, you name it. Graduated high school in 1988. He was getting ready to face life, didn't know what to do. And by the end of the summer of 88, I really got convicted and, and I repented of my sins. And... A few weeks later, I woke up in the middle of the night, and there was, I saw a couple of demons in, in the room. And I rebuked them, and they left. This is my testimony. But then when I backslid, which I did, I went back to drugs. I was telling all my buddies about seeing these demons, and so we were doing a seance one night, playing a Ouija board, and one of my buddies was like, um, hey, what were you calling those demons that you said you saw? And so we had a seance with a Ouija board. And this is what I told everybody. Everything's cool. Everything's cool. Because in Jesus' name, if they show up, we can rebuke them. Because I'm saved by grace. Of course, I had no authority. That's how I got demon-possessed. Some of you know what happened. And so that doctrine um, messed me up. And it's messing a lot of people up. So if we don't understand what it is, if we don't understand what it affects, if we don't understand how it's displayed, if we don't understand how to walk in it, then we will never learn how to trust in it to get us through our difficult times, to give us strength, because it's more than just favor. It's more than just God giving us something we don't deserve, which was salvation. Anybody else, real quick, before I give you the biblical definition? Anybody? Anybody? Probably getting ahead of myself here real quick, but a lot of times when you hear people talk about this, this is what they'll say. We're no longer under the law anymore. We're under grace. That is true. But the side that some people make that statement from, what they're meaning is we don't have to do anything now that we're saved. Live any way because we're no longer under the law. We're no longer under the ceremonial law, but God's moral law never changed. And Jesus, came, you got to understand, when Jesus, Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy it, I came to fulfill it. What he did to fulfill it was, I'll give.
And that's why he had to be conceived by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was born sinless. But he had to stay sinless, even though he lived in a body. And so when Jesus fulfilled what God demanded for him to be a sinless sacrifice, the ceremonial law was done away with. There was no need for a priest in the temple anymore because Jesus fulfilled all of that. There was no need for animal sacrifice. Jesus fulfilled all of that. And a lot of the, the holy things that you see in the Old Testament were all done away with because they were a type and a shadow of Christ. However, living righteous never ended. It continued. But we can do it now because Jesus now lives in our heart and we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, giving us the strength and ability to live in a way that we couldn't just in the flesh. It didn't matter how righteous people in the Old Testament tried to live. They didn't have a power on the inside of them, giving them that strength and ability and empowerment to live what the Lord demands. But we do. Matter of fact, I think we'll receive a stricter judgment under grace because we've been given that ability. And I'm going to prove it tonight. But it's amazing how Satan has taken this awesome biblical truth and twisted it to where you can live however you want, you can live in the flesh, you can turn back to your sin, you can do anything you want. It's okay because when God looks at the way you're living, he doesn't see the sin. You're under grace. So let's talk about this. Now, grace, the official definition, is the unmerited gift of divine favor in salvation for sinners. We talked about that. None of us could earn our salvation, right? We couldn't live righteous enough for the Lord to accept us. All of us were born in sin. There's, there, you know, none righteous, no, not one. We were all born in iniquity, so we had to have a Savior, and that's why Jesus died, right? And so what that means when it says unmerited, fa- or divine, unmerited gift excuse me, of divine favor, it means it doesn't matter what life you lived before you came to know the Lord, God will still give you what you don't deserve, forgiveness. Amen? That sin is sin, right? So no matter what sin you committed, no matter how atrocious that sin, there's no scale of sin. You know, well, I lied or I murdered somebody. Still both sin, still born in sin, still needing a savior, right? And so that's grace. God saying, Jesus died for you, that if you believe in what he did and you apply his blood to you, no matter what you did, it's an unmerited gift of divine favor in salvation for sinners, praise God. The problem is, is a lot of organization or denominations or beliefs out there stop there. They leave it there. And they believe by not rightly dividing scripture, by picking and choosing scriptures and, and, and pulling them out of context, that you can do whatever you want now because you're under grace and you won't face judgment for it. To me, When I got saved, God didn't just save me from all my past sin. That's what God saved me from. Now, you got to get this. He saved you from yourself. Because the sin nature in you is going to want to sin. And because the Lord saved you from yourself, he gave you an empowerment to live in a way different than the way your flesh wants to live. And my desire is to be more Christ-like. And that's what scripture says, walking in the spirit, being Christ-like. And the only way I'm going to accomplish that is I'm relying on the second part of this definition, which is this, the divine influence operating in individuals for their regeneration and salvation. So it is a divine influence. It is empowerment. It also means in the Greek, divine influence on the heart and how it affects the way we live. Totally different than just unmerited favor. Totally different than just slate clean, God's grace, you're forgiven. 
So we receive God's grace when we get saved, right? Because we need it for the Lord to accept us. But after salvation, grace now becomes an empowerment for us to live the way God wants us to live, to carry out our calling, to flow in the, in the gifts that God has given us. As a matter of fact, in the book of Romans and even in 1 Corinthians when it talks about the gifts of the Spirit, the word grace is in those verses. And it says, according to the grace given to me. I operate in this gift according to the grace given to me. I operate in this gift according to the grace that's given. And when you look up the meaning of grace there, it's the second part of the definition. And so the problem is, is when we study Scripture, we think that one part of the definition is the definition every time it's in Scripture. And that's not the case. And if you don't, this is why it's so key when you study Scripture. You've got to rightly divide. You've got to cross-reference, rightly divide, find out who's the scriptures talking to what's the scripture talking about what are the verses around it what are the chapters referring to you, you got to re, you got to know all those things when you're studying scripture because if you don't do that when you you won't rightly divide the word and you'll just pull one scripture out of context and build a whole doctrine around one little part of scripture and you can't do that and unfortunately this huge denomination that I was familiar with growing up has done that. And it's not true. We're going to talk about it. So what are misconceptions out there about grace? Okay, Here's, here's the first misconception. Write this down. Grace is permission to sin. The somehow God says, well, you're under grace. It's okay. Go ahead and sin. You won't face judgment for it. Now, this is the Pentecostal church, so I, and I know most of you that are here tonight, so I probably uh, think that all of you don't believe that. Some of you might. Some of you might have grown up under that doctrine. Some of you might lean toward that. So let's talk about it. Even if you don't believe in it, I'm going to equip you tonight with more knowledge about it. So when you leave here tonight, you're going to know what the Word says, okay? Let's put this, verse up, this next verse up here. I'm just going to throw some out here. They're not in order. Romans 6.15 says, What then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? That's what I talked about. God forbid. So, so this first misconception that it is a permission to sin... This verse would not be worded this way. And so what Paul is saying is, listen, <laughs> just because you're under grace, it doesn't mean you can go out and sin however you want. God forbid. Next verse. Galatians 5.13. For brethren, you have been called to liberty. Praise God. How many of you are thankful for the liberty and the freedom the Holy Spirit gives you? you got to understand, freedom in Christ is freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. Sin's bondage. Sin's slavery. Anything to do with it brings you in bondage. So why would Christ, who gave you freedom, now give you permission to do what brings you bondage? So it's not freedom to sin, it's freedom from it. And the only way you can do it is allow the empowerment of God to give you the strength to not do what you want to do. You've been called into liberty. Only use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. I mean, those two verses right there, to me, blow holes through a doctrine that says, you know how permission to sin because you're under grace. But let's look at these other verses. Matthew chapter 7. We'll go through these real quickly. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. This is, one saved always said, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom. And, no, we're not talking about people that are Islam or Buddhists or cults or whatever. He's talking about people who acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. And Jesus and not everybody that only those that do or obey or practice the will of my Father, which is in heaven. 
Verse 22. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord. Now get this. We've prophesied in your name. We've cast out devils in your name. And in your name, we've done many wonderful works. So at, at least at one time, these individuals have been able to do this, right? I mean, you're reading it with me, right? I do agree with that. However, comma. <laughs> this is the part that stands out to me. In the book of Acts, there were a group of men that were called the sons of Sceva. And they watched the disciples cast out devils. And so they thought to themselves, they weren't saved. We're going to do what we see them do. Okay. Now, if that, if that principle applied, then they would have been successful in casting out devils. And so Jesus says that we actually cast the devil out. Not try, but it actually happened. They couldn't do it. When they tried it, the demons overtook them. And... Because I'm where you're at. I've, believe me, in all the years I've been in, I mean, I've seen it. There's some things I try to reconcile. And so what I'm, what I'm reconciling is, yes, I do believe that. Um, a drunk can get on a corner and preach a message. And the power of the word is going to speak to somebody. But, but this verse, prophesying has a lot of different um, definitions. Prophesy means to proclaim, so they can proclaim, but they cannot operate in the gift of prophecy because they're not right with the Lord. And so it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's not going to anoint somebody. And so that's kind of how I reconcile that. Doing the wonderful works, you know, the Holy Spirit will not fill a vessel not right with him. But the whole casting out devils, when I rightly divide that with the sons of Sceva, that's kind of how I reconcile that. Um... So, but we've got other scriptures, though, to back up this whole thought of its permission to sin. But also, you know, Acts, two people lied to the Holy Spirit, and that dragged his body back. Oh, yeah. And you'll never convince me that hasn't happened in this book. <laughs> and we just have to drag your body. Well, and that's another scripture that it happened, and God hasn't changed, and that's New Testament. But Peter was the, you know, we lie all the time, and they lied. But if Peter had not been the voice of God to speak the judgment of God, then they would have continued lying and judgment wouldn't have came. So it requires also an obedient servant to speak truth over people, which I think most people nowadays, they don't have the courage to do, <laughs> to be honest, because that's, that's New Testament. But also the result was great fear came on the church. And so there was a reason why the Lord did that specifically at that time. Because it straightened them up. <laughs> Yeah.
Yes. Yeah, and I was going to say that. I, I think, but that finishes the thought that I had. Was saved, was anointed, did flow. So it wasn't like he never was saved. He was. And because the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance, sometimes people operate in, in a gifting and it requires the faith of the individual on the other end of that proclamation combined. There's an agreement that takes place that brings about that supernatural power of God. And so I think that's why that was happening. Um, but there comes a point, I think, I think there comes a point when the Spirit of the Lord does depart from somebody that they're in known sin and the Lord begins to convict, 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 convict. And I think there comes a time that where God says, I've dealt with you long enough, you've hardened your heart, you're not responding, and the Spirit of the Lord departs. And I believe that's scriptural. So, but the Lord said, if people are going to be able to stand before him. We did these things in your name. And then verse 23, I think I have that on there. Yes. Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that practice sin or work iniquity. So the qualifier here was not the fact that they, hey, I believe that Jesus is Lord and I'm doing these things in his name. It was the manner in which they chose to live their life. Yes. This is the thing about it, okay? Because now, now we start opening up. I knew this was going to take a little while. This, this, is, this is what happens, okay? How many of you believe that we need the grace of God every day and that probably during the course of the day today we sinned? So, so you do something that's a sin, and if your life was taken, you're going to go to hell? I don't believe that. We'll give an account. This is what I believe. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Right? The word neglect means to ignore, or disregard, or to leave undone, or a failure to attend to properly. This is what happens. One sin. You told a lie. You weren't honest. You couldn't forgive your brother. They're all sins, right? Lust of the flesh. Couldn't forgive somebody. The Holy Spirit was given to us to convict us. Jesus said that. When the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart, the Bible says when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. So there's a season that the Holy Spirit is going to work on your heart and say, you've given in to a sin. Now you need to repent of it and let my grace allow you to not go back to it again. If we keep rejecting that voice, Hebrews 2, 3 says that's the neglect. It, it's a slow by slow drip of disobedience to where the heart is getting harder and harder and harder. You've got to understand, a lot of people talk about backsliding. I don't think you backslide overnight. You're, you're not on fire for God, a prayer warrior, seeking the Lord in the word one day, and then the next day you just backslide. I believe what happens is 
when Jesus talks about leaven, he says just a little bit of leaven. And <clears throat> you all know what leaven is. Those of you that are cooks, you allow it into something and it expands. And if you don't deal with it, it contaminates. And so that's what Jesus said when he talks about leaven. And so leaven, if we allow it into our life, which is sin, and we don't do anything about it, it will contaminate all the areas of our life. And it will cause our heart to begin to drift. It's kind of like somebody that says, I'm not going to go to church this Sunday. Eh, I'm cool with it. Well, I've been in this long enough. One Sunday leads to two, leads to four, leads to eight, leads to three months. And then now you don't miss church anymore and you don't make the efforts or the discipline to make sure you're here. Most of the things that we do, listen, it's two-sided. It will lead to it, but then it becomes a symptom. It's, it's kind of like my sneezing and my, my itchy, watery eyes. Those aren't allergies. That's my body's response to pollen that's gotten in my body. So watery eyes isn't really allergies. That is my body releasing histamine into its system to attack what came in and shouldn't have been there. So it's like if you get a fever, fever isn't a sickness. Fever is a response. It is your body's natural response to fight off infection. A fever is a natural thing. And what it's trying to do is, is raise the temperature of your body and release things, get your blood flowing so your body can bring healing to itself. And so when you start seeing these things happen in your life, it, 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 what it is is an indicator of something deeper that's happening in you. And I guarantee you what's happening is you're giving in to sin, you're compromising here, you're not sacrificing and crucifying the flesh, which Galatians says we should be doing every single day. We're not picking up the cross, which Jesus says we should do. We're not doing what Paul said by dying daily, and we're allowing our flesh to start to take over and control our lives. And eventually when we continue to do that, Scripture says when we become overcome by something, then we become its slave again. And that's when we start convincing ourselves, oh, things aren't that bad, you know. It's, it's, how, many, how many have ever, I mean, I'm going to use a natural example. Try to live a healthy lifestyle, and you try to exercise, you try to, how many of you know that once you start turning away from that, it's like, it's just one slice of cake. It, it's just one extra sl piece of cake. And what happens is you don't gain 20 pounds overnight, right? And what happens is, is you'll blow it, right? And then you'll get up the next day and you're like, let's see, my clothes still fit. You look in the mirror and you're like, it doesn't look like I've gained any weight, right? But you put yourself on a path and you do that the next day and the next day and then for weeks and then for months. And all of a sudden, that's when you do wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, I've gained 20 pounds. Or more, yeah. So, and believe me, when you're in your 50s, everything changes. When I was in my 20s and 30s, it didn't matter what I ate, I took it off. In my 50s, I just look at it and I gain a pound the next day. I'm like, Lord, I just looked at it. I didn't need it. I just looked. <sighs> Everything changes. But anyway, <laughs> that's the way sin is. You give in, you give in, you give in. You got to understand when Adam and Eve finally took a bite of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden, they'd been listening to the voice of Satan. What were they doing hanging around? They'd been listening to his lies, hanging around his lies, hanging around his lies, hanging around his lies, hanging around his lies, around his lies and finally they gave in to it. And that's what happens in our life. Backsliding doesn't happen overnight. You don't, when you're in a happy marriage, you don't just get up one day and have an affair with somebody. It doesn't happen. I'm sorry. It starts out by hey, watching things on your phone you shouldn't watch, watching movies you shouldn't watch, giving in to thoughts you shouldn't give in to, reading things, and it, and it begins to decay and decay, and decay, and decay, and then that lust enters the heart, and then it eventually manifests. By the time something in your life reaches the action where you act on it, it's been going on for a while. It didn't just happen overnight. Right? Second Peter chapter 2, Michelle, let's look at this. Are y'all here with me tonight? 
Now, Peter's talking about people who are preaching what I just told you tonight. False doctrine. He says, these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from, from who live in error. Verse 19. While they promise liberty. Oh, listen, you're under grace. It's fine. It's all right. Go ahead and sin. Ah, it's, it's just one drink. I mean, come on. Scripture says moderation. No, it doesn't. Scripture says drunk. One drink, you won't get drunk. Some people, one drink, you will. That's why you abstain from it. All of it. Ah, you're okay. You're in liberty. But they themselves are servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome. Of the same he's brought in bondage. Why would I ever want to go back to the things that at one time in my life brought me bondage? If, if alcohol was my issue, plus drugs, plus everything else, why would I want to give in to, ah, it's just one beer? What? You were in bondage to it. Why do you just want one? Because my flesh will say, you can't just have one. And we'll convince, this is what we'll do, we'll convince ourselves. Well, after four, of course, it's been over 30 years since I've had any, so it wouldn't take much to do it to me. Well, after four, Four, then I will be drunk, but I can have up to four. Do you think God is going to leave your eternal soul in, in the hands of your determination of whether you're drunk or not? And, and you drink one too many, and, and you're before the Lord, and the Lord's like, man, you were great after four, but man, once you took that fifth one, mm -mm -mm. then you were drunk. It makes absolutely no sense when it comes to the topic of alcohol because you don't have the judgment to determine when's the cutoff. After three, is that, for them, they can have six. Me, I can only have three. That's why you abstain from it all. I did a whole study on this. That's why it says you don't give in to this because Proverbs calls it venom in the veins Proverbs says we're a fool when we give al ourselves over to alcohol and let it get into our veins because it doesn't stop with just one. So you abstain, period. But you'll be brought into bondage. It, it's not just that. You can sit, hold, hold on, Aaron. You know, you, you sit and watch a movie and you're like, well, I saw the review on it and um, it says it's got some sexuality in it. And the nudity that's in it is, is very brief. Um, there in the rating, it says brief nudity. So you only see the naked body for three seconds, not an extended sex scene. So it's just so I'm cool with it. Are we all human in here? That our flesh lusts after those things? So it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's alcohol or language or nudity or violence. It doesn't matter what it is. It'll bring you right back into bondage. And it is a lust of the flesh listed in Galatians. And so what Peter is saying is there's going to be people speaking, saying, you're free in Christ. You're free in Christ. You can do whatever you want. But he says, no, no, that's not the case because it's still a bondage. Saying you're under grace and you can do it that's not true. It'll still put you into bondage. That's what he's saying. Verse 20. I mean, this, we're, I mean, are we clear here? This is what he says. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How many of you are glad that you've escaped the pollutions of the world because of Jesus? Praise God. They are again entangled therein. Well, what does he mean by entangled? The three verses before it. Thinking that because of my liberty, I can give in to my flesh. 
I'm, I'm deceived into thinking I can do whatever I want, but I'm not in bondage anymore. What he says here is, if you've escaped, if you allow these things into your life, you're going to be entangled again. And what's going to happen once you become entangled, what's it say? You'll be overcome. So now it has overtaken. That's what I just said. You allow, listen, Satan is a master deceiver. And he says, it's, it's okay to do this. It's okay to watch this. It's okay to say this. It's okay to think this. It's okay to engage in this. It's, it's no big deal. But, but there, there is a, um, a process one leads to two, leads to three, whatever it is, and then we get entangled. And then when we're entangled, we can't get out. And then we become overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Look at the next two verses. Are y'all seeing this right here in Scripture? Right here in Scripture. Do I have two more verses? And Yeah. For it had been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness... Now, can you read this scripture and say, you can't backslide? You, you can't backslide. This whole series of verses is talking about how the process of backsliding takes place. We're deceived into believing something that isn't true. Hey, I'm in Christ. I've got liberty. It doesn't matter. I can do what I want. Not knowing that while doing that, we are now being entangled and overcome by the bondage of those sins. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. To turn, to turn, to turn your, to backslide. Verse 22. But it happened unto them according to the true proverb. Now this is in the Old Testament. The dog is turned to his vomit again. And the sow, the pig that was washed to her wallowing. So basically what he's saying you're going to go right back to what you were delivered from. God pulled you out of the miry clay and you went right back to it. And a dog, how many ever, I mean, I've I've had dogs throughout my whole life and that's what they do. They'll they'll throw up and they'll go right back to it. You know, you're like, no, no, no. (laughs) That's their nature. Peter says that's what happens when we go back to our sin. Yes. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, let, let me hurry real quick because we don't have very much time. Now, let's go to the next verse real quick. I want to get these verses in real quick before we go. Th- this whole misconception of um, it's permission to sin. You got to understand a lot of people that promote this, this is what they say. Well, um, they were never saved to begin with. Right. Now, these few verses that I've read, 
Does that say that they were never saved to begin with? The sow was out of the mud. The dog didn't eat its vomit. When it talks about freedom and liberty, what's it say? Entangled again? If you were never saved, you were always entangled. Right? But, you, but see, you've got to understand, how many, how many of you know what, what deconstructing, what this theology of deconstructing is? You better know about it because it's hitting the church. I'm going to talk a little bit about this Sunday. There's less church attendance and membership now than in any other time in the history of the church. The decline. You want to know why? People are leaving the church in groves. You want to know why? Because of doctrines like this. And it's called deconstructing. And what they're doing is these doctrines are attacking staple doctrines that have held the church together for 2,000 years. Jesus isn't the only way. You don't have to live a righteous life. You were born this way. See, all those are things that are finding their way into the doctrines of churches. And Scripture says in the last days, what well, we're going to talk about here, let's hurry up real quick. Let's, let's look at Revelation. We're just going to read these. I'd love to break these down a little bit more, but we'll read these. Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, you which are spiritual, restore. Restore? So there had to have been a fall to be a restoration. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Consider yourself, lest you be tempted. Amen? And that's a whole other lesson. When you do see somebody fall, don't... <laughs> right there. Next verse. It, is, it says it right there. Next verse in Galatians, Galatians 5.1. So stand fast, therefore, in the liberty here. We've talked about liberty. We've used that word liberty and freedom in a few other scriptures. And it says stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made us free. But don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So the freedom is what? Freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. Right there, it says it. Next verse. Matthew 24, 24. Jesus says, now Matthew 24, the whole chapter talks about the last days, and I believe we're here. Many false Christs and false prophets, and they will show great signs and wonders. Now that does go with Matthew 7, which we talked about earlier. I do think that the enemy is empowering some people to mislead, but this is where that, that's at. And it says, in so much that if it were possible, the very elect could be deceived. So, these, listen, these are just a few verses trying to let you see these misconceptions. The first one is uh, permission to sin. The second one is this. Um, it allows a lack of obeying God's will for our life. That's another misconception. I'm going to tell you what. If you don't carry out God's call for your life, you're going to give an account for that. What God's will is. And this whole grace doctrine, ah, it doesn't matter. You know, you do what you want in life. You were born with a purpose. And if you're not fulfilling that purpose, you're going to give an account. Now, I'm not going to say that you're not going to go to heaven. I think a lot of people are going to go to heaven and they never did fulfill their purpose. But it's going to be a whole lot easier when the Holy Spirit empowers you to do what you were created to do to continue to walk in that grace and carry out the purpose for which you were created. Another one is this. God has let up on his commands and his standards. That's another misconception. Yeah, that's not really sin. Galatians 6, 7 and 8. You've probably heard, how many of you have ever heard some of these things I'm talking about tonight? How many of you heard these things? <laughs> how many of you believe those things at one time? Maybe. I'm not going to ask if you still do. I hope you don't, not after tonight. Don't be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever you... Whatever sin you commit, you're going to reap it. So if God's lowered his standards, there's no reaping. Grace covers the reaping. If he doesn't look at it as sin, then you can't reap the consequences of it. Did you hear that? If it's not really sin, then you don't reap the consequences of it. Another lie is it comes against uh, us... Um, let me put it to you this way. Opposing effort, basically, is what I'm saying. It, it's, hey, I'm not saved by works, so works don't matter. That's basically the thought. 
eh, works don't matter. Like I said earlier, I believe works, we're not saved by works. So I can't do things to get in right setting, but I do believe the works are an outflow of my relationship with the Lord. Right? The fruit of the Spirit is an outflow of staying connected to the vine, and Jesus talked about that. Staying connected, not severed. And you know, the last misconception is it just covers up any way that we choose to live. And grace covers it up. Jude. Look at, look at Jude. You ought to read Jude. You can go home and read it. It's just it's not even one chapter. It's just you know, one chapter, yeah. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Ah, it doesn't take any effort. I'm under grace. I don't have to live. You've got to contend for the faith, which was once delivered to the saints. Verse 4 explains it. For there are certain men who have crept in unaware. When you study your Bible real quick, and then we'll end this, Almost, I'd probably say every book in the New Testament outside of Acts, there's a warning by every writer for false teachers and false workers who've come into the church. Matter of fact, read the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3 when Jesus addresses the seven churches of Asia. Most of those churches were given a warning that, that, that there was some type of false doctrine that was accepted in the church were allowed or preached, and they face judgment for allowing it to be taught. False doctrine is huge in the eyes of God. You can't add to or take away. People have come in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, sinful living, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude says it's very easy. These are ungodly people. They come in unaware. How can people come into a church that believes Scripture? How can they come in unaware? It's because they're, they're speaking religious talk, looking religious, sounding religious, going about the ministry, looking religious. And coming in as an angel of light. When we finally get to see Satan, when the judgment of everything finally culminates, when we finally see him, he isn't going to be this hideous looking horned creature. He's probably going to be the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Ever. Because scripture describes him as such. So, um, so these are some misconceptions. I'm sorry. Well, I don't know. I don't want to be sorry. I'll just put it to you this way. I had to teach this tonight. So when we really talk about how empowerment helps us get through adversity, you understand what the real grace of God is. And unfortunately, sometimes I'm a teacher. And sometimes before we get to a certain truth, I've got to give the other side. So you understand sometimes what something is not. So you can understand what it is. Does that make sense? Sometimes we've got to know what it's not to understand what it is. I've got two minutes. Has anybody got a statement? Anything they want to say? Dwight, how you doing, buddy? love you Dwight and I'm glad to see you back I was glad to see you at the breakfast Saturday and we love you and it's good to see you praise the Lord we miss you we, well we don't miss you because you're here back amen we've been missing you so anybody else just briefly anybody got anything you want to add tonight are you leaving confused I don't want you to leave confused tonight hopefully the word spoke for itself 
Amen. The word spoke for itself. Did anybody receive tonight? Are you glad I touched on it? Okay, stand with me. Amen. Father, thank you for tonight. Let the word not return void. Father, I pray that we are going to seek you like never before and we're going to shut the door to any false doctrine uh, allowing its way into us, deceiving us and leading us astray. And Father, we do thank you for grace. We couldn't live without it. We thank you for it. We thank you that you gave it to us. And we thank you that when we submit to you, daily you give it to us to live a life that you've commanded us to live. Lord, go with us tonight. See everybody home safely and bring us back safely on Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you, church family. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.